We're continuing our study of Matthew. We're actually getting into Matthew chapter 18 today, which is a, a really great chapter. Not that any of them are not, but I really like this chapter. There's a lot of great stuff here. Uh, we're going to get through the first 14 verses. Uh, for the most part, we're going to come back to verses 10 through 14 next week as well as we move on past verse 14. The title of the message is Child Support. Uh, most of the time, it's not flattering to be compared to a child, right? Like you, you don't want, in our society, you know, if someone says you throw like a child or, you know, you, you talk like a child, you write like a child, uh, you know, it's, it's not a compliment when someone says that you're childish. Children, they're small, they're weak, they're uh, underdeveloped, you know, inexperienced, naive. Uh, they often, they take you know, a lot more than they, they contribute and give, and it's just the nature of being a child, but, you know, um, yet at the same time, we value children immensely. Uh, we love children. We dedicate so much to children. You know, we spend tons of money on children, and, and we save up throughout our lives so that we can leave something behind for our children, even if they're grown at that point. But still, parents, they've always strived to be good parents. I mean, they, they've taken bad advice sometimes. That's why we end up with helicopter parents and lawnmower parenting and things like that. But that's still people just trying to do the right thing. They just don't really know what to do. That's why parents can be overprotective. And, uh, you know, when it comes to safety of our children, money is no object. Uh, you think about the decisions that are made in our society. You know, people make decisions on the houses and the cars that they're going to buy, thinking about their kids, right? They make decisions on what state or, you know, city or neighborhood they're going to live in, thinking about their kids. Even who they're going to marry, sometimes thinking about kids they already have, or sometimes they're thinking about the kids that they want to have in the future. I mean, kids influence a lot of our decisions in, in culture. But most of the time, I'm not trying to teach people how to be like children. Instead, I'm trying to teach people to grow up. And, and that's hard, and that's a problem in our society in general. And uh, Have you heard the, the new acronym NEAT? When people talk about the NEATs. Oh, Grace, you shook your head? No, I'm surprised by that. Uh, N-E-E-T. It's a new acronym out there. You'll probably see it floating around at some point. It stands for, uh, it's people who are not in education, employment, uh, or training, okay, N-E-E-T. And so when we think about the age range of, uh, according to the International Labor Organization, about 20% of people worldwide, age 15 to 24, are NEETs. And then that statistic was 14.5% in our country. And so you've got a huge percentage of working, you know, age young people who are not working, not looking for work, and are not even preparing to go into the workforce, as in through their education. And that's a problem. And on top of that, when you think about the people in those age ranges that actually are working, there's also a big percentage of them who don't want a career. They just kind of want whatever easy job they can get by with. You know, there's definitely a shift culturally. And that's a, it's a problem in our country, but there's a spiritual problem in our country about growing up as well. Uh, you, we think back to the rebuke that Paul had for the Corinthians when he was talking to them and he was like, you know, you, you should be eating solid food by now, but I have to feed you milk because, but that's not, you should be more mature. Not only should you be eating solid food, but you should actually be feeding others. You should be teachers. But instead, I keep having to go back to the basics. And Paul rebukes the Corinthians for that. And too many people in our culture, both, you know, in secular ways and in spiritual ways, are just not growing up. That's not really the point that we're getting at today, though. Because today, we're actually going to learn the good way to be like a child. And there is one. There's not a lot, <laughs> but there's at least one. And Jesus talks about that in our passage today. 
And I, I appreciated the way John MacArthur broke down chapter 18. Like he was talking about the, the whole of chapter 18. And he said there were five lessons that you learn in Matthew 18. And he broke it down like this, that the people of the kingdom must enter like children, be treated like children, be cared for like children, be disciplined like children, and be forgiven like children. Uh, I think that's a good summary of what you learn in, in chapter 18. Obviously, we're going to get into details. And I'm going to break it down in a little differently than he does, uh, although the first point is going to be the same. But that's what we're going to learn today. How should we be like a kid and how should we support God's children so God we pray that you would give us your grace that you would give us your wisdom that you would help us to understand and apply what we're learning uh, that we would leave here today um, more mature and also more like a child and that um, that we'd be blessed because of that that you would bless our, our church because we become more childlike. So help us to understand what that means in Christ's name. Amen. We're going to start in verses 1 through 4 of Matthew 18. At that time, the disciples came to Jesus and asked, So who is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven? You need to understand right now that they're asking about themselves. Uh, which one of them is the greatest? He called a small child and had him stand among them. Truly, I tell you, he said, unless you turn and become like little children, you will never enter the kingdom of heaven. Therefore, whoever humbles himself like this child, this one is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven. So let's start by recognizing how absurd their question is. Uh, they're asking about which one of them is going to be the greatest in the kingdom of heaven. And we know that that's a silly question because it's Peter. Everybody knows that. <laughs> No, I'm just kidding. That's not, that's not why it's a silly question. Now, I want to think about why this question would even come up. Like, was there something that triggered this question? I don't know. But maybe it's that Peter had recently been singled out by Jesus and said, upon this rock I will build my church. Or maybe it's that Peter, James, and John had just gone up the mountain and, and witnessed the transfiguration and now the other disciples didn't know what happened up on that mountain, but they probably knew something big happened up there. And so maybe there's in view some jealousy happening, or maybe they see an opportunity because, yeah, Peter got singled out recently, but also Jesus called him Satan recently. So maybe they were like, we can get our foot in the door. I don't know. But it's not an absurd question because it's an obvious answer. That, that That's me just being silly. It's absurd because it completely... Rejects. I mean, they, they've forgotten so much of what Jesus has been teaching them. You know, he, he taught them, blessed are the poor in spirit. Blessed are the meek. He taught them about the danger of pride as it relates to you know, prayer and fasting and giving. You know, think back to the Sermon on the Mount. But apparently, with this particular issue, he had not yet gotten as direct and explicit with them as he needed to. And boy, oh boy, did he get direct. I mean, look at what he says. Like he called a child over. He told them that unless they turn and become like children, they will never enter heaven. Now, I don't think Jesus was trying to portray to them like, you're just a bunch of rotten sinners that are going to hell anyway. But I, think about how this would come across. You know, they're like, which one of us is going to be the greatest in heaven? And he's like, well, unless you change and become like a child, you're not going to be there at all. That's a pretty direct thing to say. I imagine Jesus being like, well, guys, do you remember how I told you that the gate is narrow? Like, yeah, 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 we understand, Jesus, the gate's narrow. And he's like, well, right now your heads are too big to get through it. And we must enter the kingdom like children. Jesus does a strange thing. He, he kind of, in effect, says, you need to stop acting like men and start acting like children, which would be a weird thing for them to hear. Uh, that would be new to them. Douglas O'Donnell said, some scholars are convinced that this is the first and only time in ancient Jewish literature, perhaps all ancient literature, where a child is used as a positive example. You know, children were not valued 
in that culture the way that they are today. Uh, children get a lot of attention now. A lot of focus is, I mean, think about the industries that we have built targeting children. You think about the toy industry. I mean, the TVs and movies, even clothing and food and, and, and leisure, vacation, sports. I mean, our culture strives to keep children engaged, entertained, comfortable, happy, and spoiled. And it was not the case in this culture that we're reading about. Back then, you weren't going to hear people tell you that you need to be embrace your inner child. That wasn't a mantra that was going around. But here's Jesus. He says you must become like a child to enter heaven. Now, obviously, this doesn't mean you need to be like a child in every way. You don't need to look like a child. Uh, you don't need to be small like they are. You don't need to be naive and temperamental. Uh, it doesn't even mean that we need to be like children in some ways. I mean, he specifies that he's talking about a particular characteristic, and that is humility. Now, when I read that, the wheels in my head start turning because I'm like, how are children humble? I've got three of them, and that doesn't, that's not a characteristic that I would usually use to Describe children. You know, children often think they know a lot more than they do, right? They overestimate their knowledge, their strength, their skills and abilities. I mean, they, they talk trash when they win games. They, they tend to think that they're the most beautiful, amazing specimen that's ever been, you know, that's ever graced the earth. Pride is the natural bent of a child. So what is Jesus getting at? Well... I will say that kids can be humble in, in a way that they recognize their dependency. Uh, children do overestimate themselves, but they also recognize that they're very dependent. Like my, my kids would not be okay with mom and dad leaving them at home alone for a week. They wouldn't feel like, uh, we don't need mom and dad, you know, we're good. They understand they need us and they trust us to take care of them. And so maybe Jesus has in view some of that trust and dependency that kids have. But I think more and, and, and maybe not just more, but maybe completely what Jesus is actually talking about is the status of a child. Like children are low in status in the world. And the disciples are arguing about status. And then he, he comes along and he says, well, actually, you need to be humble like a child, as in you need to stop thinking about status. You need to lower yourselves and, and put yourselves on the bottom. Only one who recognizes that they, they don't actually have anything to offer. You can't, you, you can't get into heaven. You can't enter the kingdom of heaven because you are, are really rich or really high up or, or that you're high on the status social the status totem pole or something like that you have to recognize that you have nothing to offer you need to lower yourselves and that's how you enter big heads don't fit through narrow gates i i can think i, I can just envision them arguing about this and jesus saying you guys stop arguing about who's going to be the greatest in heaven you do understand that i am the greatest in heaven right that's what you need to be focused on. And I can tell you this morning, if you are a true Christian, if you've really repented of your sins and put your faith in Christ and followed him as the Lord of your life, when you get to heaven, status will be the last thing on your mind. That's what the disciples didn't get. They didn't have heavenly minds yet. That would grow in them. But right now they had earthly minds thinking about heaven they needed heavenly minds thinking about earth. And if you want to enter God's kingdom, you must enter it like a child, humble, dependent, completely trusting in not yourself, but in God's grace. And then in verse five, he said, whoever welcomes one child like this in my name welcomes me. Not only do we enter like children, but once we go through those gates. We must be welcomed like children. Understand that as we move through the rest of this passage, Jesus, 
people sometimes misunderstand. They, they start applying everything to like physical children. That's not what Jesus is talking about. He's talking about spiritual children. All right. He used a physical child as an example for of a spiritual thing that he's talking about. And so as we move on, he's talking about welcoming children. He's talking about welcoming his children, welcoming Christians. And he's teaching here that we must welcome them like we would welcome him. How we treat them is how we treat him. It kind of reminds us of when Jesus appeared to Paul. You know, when, when he stepped before Paul and stopped him on the road and, and he's like, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting who? He said, me. Who had Paul been persecuting? Christians. But Jesus comes and he says, why are you persecuting me? Because how we treat God's children is how we treat Christ himself. And we should welcome one another like we would welcome Jesus. It also brings to mind Matthew 25, 31 through 46, when the Son of Man comes in his glory and all the angels with him, then he will sit on his glorious throne. Before him will be gathered all the nations and he will separate people one from uh, another as a shepherd separates the sheep from the goats. And he will place the sheep on his right, but the goats on the left. Then the king will say to those on his right, Come, you who are blessed by my father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. For I was hungry, and you gave me food. I was thirsty, and you gave me drink. I was a stranger, and you welcomed me. I was naked, and you clothed me. I was sick, and you visited me. I was in prison, and you came to me. Then the righteous will answer him, saying, Lord, <laughs> When did we see you hungry and feed you or thirsty and give you drink? When did we see you a stranger and welcome you or naked and clothe you? When did we see you sick or in prison and visit you? And the king will answer them, truly I say to you, as you did it to one of the least of these my brothers, you did it to me. And he goes on. He says to those on his left, depart from me, you cursed into the eternal fire prepared for the devil and his angels. For I was hungry and you gave me no food. I was thirsty and you gave me no drink. I was a stranger and you did not welcome me. Naked and you did not clothe me. Sick and in prison, you did not visit me. Then they will also answer saying, Lord, when, when did we see you hungry or thirsty or a stranger or naked or in prison or sick and did not minister to you? And he will answer them saying, truly I say to you, as you did not do it to one of the least of these, you did not do it to me. And these will go away into eternal punishment, but the righteous into eternal life. How we treat God's people is how we treat Christ. We learned last week how to be accommodating, right, to both believers and unbelievers. And then Jesus comes along in this passage and brings a very tightly uh, connected message of being welcoming. We think about how the disciples, they were arguing about status. And Jesus says, actually, you need to have, you need to be like a child in your status. And then he goes on to say, amongst yourselves, you need to ignore status. And you need to welcome one another. Similar to what we see in James 2, 1 through 9, my brothers, show no partiality as you hold the faith in our Lord Jesus Christ, the Lord of glory. For if a man wearing a gold ring and fine clothing comes into your assembly and a poor man in shabby clothing also comes in, if you pay attention to the one who wears the fine clothing and say, you sit here in a good place while you say to the poor man, stand over there or sit at my feet, have you not then made distinctions among yourselves and become judges with evil thoughts? Listen, my beloved brothers, has not God chosen those who are poor in the world to be rich in faith and heirs of the kingdom, which he has promised to those who love him? But you have dishonored the poor man. Are not the rich the ones who oppress you and the ones who drag you into court? Are they not the ones who blaspheme the honorable name by which you were called? If you really fulfill the royal law according to the scripture, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. Now, now you know why we read Leviticus. You are doing well. But if you show partiality... You are committing sin and are convicted by the law as transgressors. See, whomever comes with faith in Jesus, we welcome. There should not be partiality. It's about faith. So it doesn't matter if you're old or crippled or if you're young. 
It doesn't matter if you're in poverty or if you make more in interest every month than I make in salary every year. It doesn't matter. It doesn't matter if you come from the family of Billy Graham or Osama bin Laden. That does not matter if you have faith in Jesus Christ. When we look at Christians, we should see Christ. Not Todd. Not Tom. Not Natty. We see Jesus. And we treat each other as such. Can you imagine if Jesus showed favoritism to you? I don't think it would work in your favor. Can you imagine if he showed favoritism? What would that mean for Peter? Or any of the other disciples for that matter? Yeah. There's no place for that in Christ's church. We welcome, we are welcomed like God's children amongst ourselves. And Jesus continues in verses 6 through 9, But whoever causes one of these little ones who believe in me to fall away, it would be better for him if a heavy millstone were hung around his neck and he were drowned in the depths of the sea. Woe to the world because of offenses. For offenses will inevitably come. Now, offenses, when you read that, think sin, temptation, okay? But woe to that person by whom the offense comes. If your hand or your foot causes you to fall away, cut it off and throw it away. It's better for you to enter life maimed or lame than to have two hands or two feet and be thrown into the eternal fire. And if your eye causes you to fall away, gouge it out, throw it away. It's better for you to enter life with one eye than to have two eyes and be thrown into hellfire. Here we find that we must be protected like children. Jesus warns it would be worse for someone, it would be better to be drowned in the sea than to bring God's children into sin. Now, temptations are inevitable. Jesus says that. We live in a broken world. You are not going to completely avoid temptation. But then he says, but woe to whomever brings the temptation. God's people protect one another by leading each other away from sin and temptation instead of toward it. And with this point of protecting, I have four subpoints because I want to look at four ways in which we can lead others into temptation. And the first is by commission. This is when we directly tempt someone else. What does that look like? The list is endless. It's anything that's a direct solicitation of someone else to sin. Could be all kinds of things. Could be, hey, come look at this picture that neither one of us should be looking at. It could be, uh, you should punch that guy. You know, you should key his car. I mean, he's, he's a jerk. He's got it coming. Just do it. It could be, oh, come on, babe. I mean, we're, we're getting married. Like, the date's already set. We've committed to one another. Why do we need to wait? Come on, let's do it. Maybe you tell somebody that they should lie. You know, I think that's your only choice, man. You need to lie. That's the, that's the only way out of this. I don't see another way. Or you, got, you see people struggling in marriage, and maybe you take someone's side in that marriage, and you say, you know what? I think you should divorce them. There's all kinds of ways that we can coax other people into sin. And should I have to say, don't do that? I'm saying it just in case. But we also tempt people by transmission. I'm not talking about five speeds or automatics or CVTs. Uh, I'm getting kind of loose. I'm getting kind of creative with my words and on this point and the next one. So my alliteration needs explanation. Uh, this is when we tempt someone indirectly. It's more of an implicit thing than an explicit thing. So it, it's like we're transporting people into sin. When you transmit something, you know, you send it. So you're kind of sending people towards sin. And like... For instance, maybe wearing immodest clothing. You know, you might not walk up to someone and explicitly solicit them for sex, but you can tempt them in that way, indirectly. It might be saying just the right thing that you know is going to push someone's button. You know what that is. You know, you never pick up your stuff, whatever it is. And we try, here's the thing. Well, okay, 
the gist of this is that we're, we're provoking other people. Ephesians 6, 4 says, Fathers, do not provoke your children to anger, but bring them up in the discipline and instruction of the Lord. We think, well, how do you provoke uh, your child to anger? All, you could be overbearing. You could not listen to them. Uh, you could have too high of expectations. You can be harsh. Now, we can do that with people of all ages and provoke them in many different ways. And this connects well with the scriptures that we were reading last week, how we were talking about not putting stumbling blocks in front of someone else. And that's exactly what this is when we provoke other people towards temptation and sin. Like you might not grab them and yank them into the puddle of sin that's sitting before them, but you might stick your foot out and trip them. And the, the thing about this is we actually try to get ourselves off the hook for this kind of thing. We act like we're not culpable for this kind of thing, but we are. We don't get to use the argument that we're not responsible because they made the choice. I didn't make them do it. Well, that's true. You, didn't, you can't make someone angry, but you can provoke them to anger. You can't make someone lust, but you can provoke them to lust. And the provocation itself is a separate sin that we are culpable for. You know, you can't force someone to lie, but you could force them into a situation where they're strongly tempted to lie because you put them in that situation. And when things like that happen, we don't get to just shift the blame and start pointing fingers and say, well, I didn't make them do it, so it's on them, not me. Well, now it's true, like, you didn't make them do it, but it's also on you too. Now. If someone provokes you, you also don't get to start pointing the finger and say, well, they made me do it and act like it's their fault. No, we, we just take responsibility. We've got to re be responsible for our choices, whether it be giving into the temptation or whether it be bringing the temptation. And third, we can tempt others by emission. This is uh, setting a bad example. You get it? We, we emit the wrong example. So I can bring my children or anybody else into temptation without directly or indirectly tempting them. It might be a situation that has nothing to do with them. They might not be involved at all, but they see it play out. They see the example that I set. And because of that bad example, it leads them to temptation. It leads them the wrong direction. All they have to do is see it. It might be, a, uh, well, 1 Corinthians 4, 15 and 16. For though you have countless guides in Christ, you do not have many fathers. For I became your father in Christ Jesus through the gospel. I urge you then, be imitators of me. Also, chapter 11, verse 1, be imitators of me as I am of Christ. 2 Thessalonians 3, 7 through 9. For you yourselves know how you ought to imitate us, because we were not idle when we were with you, nor did we eat anyone's bread without paying for it. But with toil and labor we worked night and day, that we might not be a burden to any of you. It was not because we do not have the right, but to give you in ourselves an example to imitate. Hebrews 13.7 Remember your leaders, those who spoke to you the word of God. Consider the outcome of their way of life and imitate their faith. You see, when we provide bad examples, we're not pr protecting our brothers and sisters from temptation and sin. We're leading them towards it. John MacArthur shared a story about a boy who snuck out of the house in the winter. He was following his dad, who was an alcoholic, and there was snow out on the ground, so his dad was walking through the snow to the bar, and as he was walking, he heard something behind him. He looked back, and he saw his son, and he said, where, where are you going? And he was jumping, the little boy was jumping from footstep to footstep of his dad. And he said, I'm just following your footsteps, dad. And somebody in your life is following your footsteps. And we have a responsibility to lead them by example, to be worthy of imitating. Now, if you think you found the loophole in this because you're like, well, I found, I found the way out of this because nobody's following my footsteps. I'm not an example to anybody. You haven't found a loophole. You've just jumped into a different sin. And that would be tempting others by omission. 
by not actively leading them away from sin. We're not just called to not lead others towards sin. We are called to lead others away from sin. So we, we are actually supposed to be an example. We are supposed to be influencing others. And if you think, so if you think you're off the hook because you're a recluse and you don't have anybody looking to you as an example, well, what you've actually done is neglected your duty. And that would be like a doctor thinking that they, they had fulfilled their job because they help their patients whenever they get sick or injured. But it's also a doctor's job to help prevent illness and injury. And it's our job to help prevent one another from being tempted and from falling into it and sinning. Hebrews 10, 24 and 25 says, let us consider how to stir up one another to love and good works, not neglecting to meet together as is the habit of some, but encouraging one another and all the more as you see the day draw near. See, we have a duty. Scripture calls it, describes it in many ways, like sharpening one another. Here we see encouraging one another, stirring one another up. The idea of pushing, pulling, prodding one another towards righteousness. And what would that look like? It takes many forms. One of them is not neglecting to meet together, right? So we go to church. We involve ourselves in the body of Christ. We, we pray for one another. We ask one another hard questions. So if I see my brother in Christ struggling with lust, instead of just sitting back and, and, and hoping that he makes it through it, I inject myself into his life. And I say, hey, I want to pray for you. Hey, I want to ho help hold you accountable. I want to help introduce good things into your life. Here's some scriptures to memorize. Let's do this together. Here, here's, here's some software that I think will help keep the temptation maybe at bay when you're struggling. Here's some, a book that you need to read, counsel that you need. When I see uh, a struggling marriage, instead of just hoping for the best, I actually intercede and step in and implore them. No, God's design is that you forgive, that you work this out, that you stick together. Like your marriage is a representative of your relationship with Christ. So we actually get involved in people's lives. Instead of being a recluse who sticks to themselves and tries not to have any influence on others, we actually should seek to find ways to influence others. To be an example, be a mentor. Instead of looking around at your church and sitting back and hoping that God continues to move, you actually be a healthy member of the body of Christ. In 1 Corinthians 12, Paul talks about the body of Christ. He describes it as one body with many members or many parts. And he says that every part of the body is a part of the body for one thing, whether they want to be or whether they like recognize their role and function or not. And then he says, and every part is needed for the body to function well, for it to function correctly. And no part of the body can say to another part, I don't need you. And he says in, in 12, 24 and 25, but God has so composed the body, giving greater honor to the part that lacked it, that there may be no division in the body, but that the members may have the same care for one another. See, we are called to have the same care for one another. No one in Riviera Baptist Church is called to care less than anyone else. We don't all care in the same ways. We care in different ways and we, we play different roles and functions in the body, but we're all supposed to care equally. We share that care. So if you think that you're just here to be cared for, then if you're, if you're a, a believer, if you're a, a Christian, then what you've done is you've misunderstood what it means to be saved into the body of Christ. Don't pawn your job off to somebody else. You have a job in the body. And I'm telling you that that job is not to just sit, listen, and write checks is to be a well-functioning member. And we are called to protect one another. If we're not protecting one another, but actually instead are having a negative impact, are leading people towards sin temptation, Jesus says, woe to you. 
that body of skin and muscle and fat and bones that you walk around in would be better off as decoration at the bottom of the sea, as food for the fish, than it would be sitting in this sanctuary this morning. Is that harsh? Well, if it is, it's harsh in a perfect way because Jesus is the one that said it. So we have a responsibility not to neglect what we're called to, to protect one another. Now we're going to finish the last section of this passage, verses 10 through 14. See to it that you don't despise one of these little ones, because I tell you that in heaven their angels continually view the face of my Father in heaven. What do you think? If someone has a hundred sheep and one of them goes astray, won't he leave the ninety-nine on the hillside and go and search for the stray? And if he finds it, truly I tell you, he rejoices over that sheep more than over the ninety-nine that did not go astray. In the same way, it is not the will of your Father in heaven that one of these little ones perish. I will clarify that I didn't uh, get into verses 8 and 9 because those, like what he talks about, of like if your hand causes you to sin, cut it off and stuff, we covered basically the exact same thing that Jesus said in, in chapter 5 and where we talk about the personal temptations and how far we should go and how we should avoid temptation. So that's why I'm, I'm skipping over that part in a way. But here we see that we must be valued like children. Now, I, I can't take for granted that anyone anymore actually values children, uh, especially in our society. It was interesting because McCar John MacArthur, in a sermon from 2007, he said, who despises a baby? That's not the point. But you despise babies? I hate babies. Anybody say that? Get that thing away from me. You can't stand babies. No, nobody despises babies. Nobody despises children. And I wonder if he would actually, if he would say that again today, because the way we've seen happen over the past couple decades and how increasingly more and more people actually do despise children, which is just horrendous to think about. But that is beside the point, because that's not the point of this. This is about valuing one another like God values us. Again, it's about valuing one another like God values his children is how we should value one another. And before I elaborate on that, I also want to make it clear that this passage does not teach that every child has a guardian angel. If you notice the beginning of that, those last verses. Um, for one thing, again, this is not about physical children. It's about spiritual children. But it also doesn't teach that every Christian has a, a specifically assigned guardian angel to them. Uh, the Bible doesn't give us that uh, view. It, it, it says collectively. It's a collective phrase that's used there. Their angels, right? That's a collective. The Bible never talks about there being, you know, a one-on-one -on -one relationship and guardian angels and things like that. The Bible does teach in Hebrews 1.14 that angels are ministering spirits sent out to serve for the sake of those who are to inherit salvation. And so we don't neglect the, the fact that God uses angels to minister, to serve, uh, and to work in believers' lives in a variety of ways. Uh, but I just, I don't want to chase this. I just want to clarify just in case, because uh, that's kind of just a, a thing that people get that idea from this passage. But instead, rather than despising one another, we are called to value one another. And Jesus illustrates the kind of value that we should have one another with a story about a shepherd and his sheep. And it teaches us that he values us so much that when we stray, he cares and he goes after us. Now, God could have a completely different attitude towards a straying sheep. He could say, stupid sheep. I mean, you're not worth my time if you can't even stay here with me. Or he could have a different kind of attitude. He could say, well, I'm sad about that, but, you know, I'm here if you come back. But instead... He cares, and he cares enough that he goes after us. Now, people do misuse this story as maybe kind of an excuse to say, 
to get the idea that we should just always be chasing after straying sheep and like that's like that that's what a pastor should always be doing and that they spend all their time out there chasing after straying sheep whether the sheep want to come back or not and stuff like that that's taking this too far that's not what Jesus is teaching about here he's teaching about the value of the sheep now next week we are going to see how this also connects to church discipline right and and how what happens when a sheep does stray and how do we go after them and what do we do when we go after them and they don't listen and so Jesus will get into that process of church discipline but the idea here is not that the the shepherd leaves the flock and he just you know he goes to the sheep and the sheep doesn't want to listen but he follows him and he just keeps going after them anyway or he gets a sheep that wants to come back and he comes and he drops them off and then he just takes off again and the shepherd's never with his flock and you know we're not taking it that's that's the wrong way to take it but it does teach us every sheep is valuable and valuable enough that when they stray we go after them and that's something that I think we can all get better at. It's something that I want to get better at. It's something that I want our church to get better at. I actually have plans of how we can get better at going after strange sheep, especially like it's one thing when we see a brother or sister in Christ kind of fall into this egregious, open, you know, sin that we're just really concerned about. And, and we go after them and we try to turn them away from that sin. But I think the biggest way in which this gets neglected is with those who neglect the gathering with people who just kind of stop being around. They just stop attending church. And we need to care enough to go after them. That's on me, but it's not just on me. Like, don't get the idea. You read this passage and you're like, well, Jesus is the good shepherd. This is about him. It doesn't apply to me. Or pastors are shepherds. This is about them. It doesn't apply to me. No, this is something we're all called to do. We're all called to value one another enough to chase after the straying sheep. We need to value one another like God values his own children, like we would value our children. Would you try to stop your child from straying? Absolutely you would. Would you go after them if they did stray? Of course. Would you pray for them? persistently if you went after them and they didn't listen you would never stop would you ever treat your child like they're a hopeless case no and that's the way that we should value one another so if you want to walk through the pearly gates if you want to enter the kingdom of heaven you must enter like a child humble and dependent fully trusting in God's grace not your works not your status not your goodness. And as we walk Christian life together, we must welcome one another without favoritism, without regard to anything except genuine faith. And when we get the privilege of welcoming a new child into the family of God, we have a responsibility to protect them, to protect one another. I, I love Jesus in his, the prayer that he taught his disciples. Part of the prayer says... Uh, and lead me not into temptation, but deliver us from evil, right? And that's something that he taught us to pray, but it's also something that we can say to one another. Lead me not into temptation, but deliver me from evil. In fact, I think we should say that to one another. Would you, would you uh, humor me and, and would you stand? If you can stand, and if you can't, then you can turn your head. But I want you to stand, and I want, I want this side to face that side, and that side to face this side. I want you to look at one another. And would you say, brother, sister, lead me not into temptation, but deliver me from evil. Say it. And look around. If you see anyone here who has truly repented of their sins and put their faith in Christ, they are a child of God. Value them as such. Protect them as such.